Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Right now on Indiana News Desk, a new freight rail system will improve how Indiana connects with the world. As a consumer, it should uh, lower your cost because uh, everything that you buy has some transportation costs built into it. So if you can control that, it's, it's uh, cheaper as well. And a look inside John Mellencamp's latest project, a musical. The rocker collaborated with Stephen King and T-Bone Burnett to create Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. We got our hearts out on this, I guess. The two are already calling it a success, even though it may never run on Broadway. More on how Mellencamp and King work together to bring the ghostly tale to life. Those stories and a look at the week's top headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, welcome to Studio 6 for this week's Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. We begin this week with an update on a story that's affecting thousands of Hoosiers, the federal government shutdown. It's been a week and a half and Congress still hasn't come to an agreement, but some things have changed in Indiana. Some people who were initially furloughed have been called back to work. All but seven of the 1,000 National Guard federal technicians were back on the job Monday. That's because Congress passed a bill that funds the armed forces and some of the civilian workers that support them. Anytime you know you can bring employees back to work, that stabilization, knowing that they are one a productive member of the organization, and uh, obviously with the pay issues that they that they may have been facing. Uh, we're very excited to know that we have this opportunity to return back to duty and perform our, uh, our mission here at Atterbury Miscanica. Funding sources are so varied and complicated, there are still more than 200 state employees in the National Guard who the federal government is not paying. Governor Mike Pence said earlier this week the state would continue to pay their salaries. And the state has promised to fund the food stamp and welfare programs through the end of this month, even though the money for the programs is running out. But while some are breathing a small sigh of relief right now, others are seeing things get worse as the shutdown continues. The federal court for southern Indiana put about 400 cases on hold because federal employees working on those cases have been put on leave and can't meet court deadlines. And as Indiana farmers begin harvesting their crops, they're having a hard time finding out how much to charge for their products. The U.S. Department of Agriculture keeps a track of supply and demand trends, which influences prices, but their offices are among those shut down. It's quite a critical situation with crop numbers as to whether there's going to be enough crop to supply the rest of the country for the rest of the year. But without the government, with the government being shut down, they're not doing their, they've canceled their monthly report for this Thursday the 10th, which was the big report that everybody was waiting on. The USDA did release a report in September, but it didn't take into account thousands of acres that didn't get planted because of heavy rains earlier this year. But even as Congress continues to look for a solution, another deadline is looming. If legislators don't raise the debt ceiling by October 17th, the U.S. could default on its debt. Indiana ships a wide variety of products overseas, everything from auto parts, medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, corn and soybeans. Together, exports bring in more than $34 billion to the state economy. Indiana is hoping to increase those exports with a new rail system debuting this week. As Claire McInerney reports, the so-called intermodal system could increase demand for Indiana products and decrease the price Hoosiers pay for goods shipped into the state. The new Indiana Railroad Company facility in Indianapolis allows businesses to bring their goods into the rail yard, where they will be loaded into large box containers put onto trains and shipped out of the state. It promises to cut shipping time to Asia by about a week, 
from 25 days to 20 days. It's going to make importers more competitive. It's going to reduce their transit times. They won't have as, money, as much money tied up in inventory, but it's certainly going to make Indiana manufacturers, exporters, more competitive going overseas as well. So how exactly is the rail going to do this? Let's back up and start at the ground level. I mean, literally, the ground level. As harvest season begins in Indiana, millions of bushels of soybeans and corn are being prepared for sale. Jim Langford is in the middle of harvesting his crop. Once he's done, he'll sell it to processors and distributors. Under the previous system, the distributor would likely use a truck to drive Jim's crops up to Chicago. The load might sit there for several days while it's being sorted along with other products from the Midwest. Then it would be loaded on a train to the West Coast, where it would be put on a ship and taken to Asia. With the new rail, the distributor can take the crops directly to the rail yard in Indianapolis. The load will be put on a train there and shipped directly to the West Coast, bypassing the bottleneck in Chicago. Shorter shipping times and lower costs could increase demand for Indiana products, and that could benefit many Hoosiers, including Langford. All the soybean producers and so on in Indiana uh, very well could, uh, because depending on the markets uh, and the prices and so on, that normally uh, uh, has a bearing on how many soybeans we plant versus other crops, and the better the price. And then there are the middlemen. Merchandise warehousing has been in Tim Sadiq's family for more than six decades. The company stores products from Indiana and other Midwestern manufacturers. And the new rail hub is located right across the street, a selling point for both customers and consumers. As a consumer, it should uh, lower your cost. Everything that you buy has some transportation cost built into it. So if you can control that, it's, it's uh, cheaper as well. And in addition to that, uh, consumers are concerned about going green. Well, rail is a very green option. So the CO2s uh, are significantly lower than transporting by truck. In all of this, businesses are focusing on one part of the world, Asia. The U.S. imported more than $300 billion worth of goods from Asia in 2012 alone, mostly technology such as smartphones and tablets. Cutting down on importing costs could decrease the prices Hoosiers are paying for those products. So yes, that means a rail line in Indianapolis could mean you pay less for your iPhone. And when it comes to exports, China buys seven times more Indiana products now than it did a decade ago. Much of that can be attributed to Indiana's agriculture industry. We export about $1.7 billion worth of soybeans alone from the state. And if you look at the U.S. as a whole, China represents 60 percent of the U.S. market, which is, again, huge. So you're, you're looking at a, a huge market for agricultural products, and one that almost, in, in terms of Indiana, dwarfs all those other export categories. There are also exports like medical devices, medicines, and car parts. And the companies that make those are vying for a piece of Asia's growing economy. Really, China's the 800-pound gorilla, because uh, their growth has been almost 20 percent over the last 10 years. Uh, that's an average annual rate. So uh, it's, it's increased almost well over fivefold in the last 10 years. But Indiana isn't the only one trying to tap into the Asian market. Other states have had hubs like the one in Indianapolis for years, and they're also constantly seeking ways to make their systems more efficient and cost effective. And reporter Claire McInerney rejoins us now to give us some additional uh, perspectives on what Indiana is doing to market itself to Asia. Your report showed that Indiana is investing a lot in working with Asia, in this case, of course, rail. But sometimes we see in the news where the state will send, let's say, a delegation to China. Some communities do that with their mayors. What are some of the other efforts that the state is doing? Sure. Um, it's well known that Indiana is a big manufacturing uh, state in terms of our economy. Auto manufacturing is a huge part of that, and so there's a lot of Asian automobile companies either that have plants based here or that get their parts from Indiana, including companies like Cummins that produce auto parts. So a lot of times we see um, interactions between Indiana companies or legislators, mayors, like you mentioned, going over there and just keeping that relationship going. So if you remember from the news last month, Governor Pence traveled to Japan, spent a week there in what he called a jobs trip and just did exactly that, spent time with people in the auto industry, basically thanking them and showing their 
uh, his appreciation that they have their companies in Indiana when they have so many states in the United States that they can choose from. Can you put a dollar figure on that? I mean, how much is Asia worth to Indiana? I don't have a comprehensive number, but we see all the time um, that there's growth in terms of manufacturing and auto in Indiana. So just in the last few months, in terms of numbers, Subaru announced that they're going to be investing $450 million, creating 900 jobs. Uh, NSK, a manufacturing company, is investing uh, 30 million and then Mitsubishi is going to invest 10 million. So there's these stories constantly pop up and there is a lot of money being put into the manufacturing and exports industry here. Okay, well thank you very much. And now we go over to Alex Dierkman for a look at this week's top stories. One of the big stories that we're following is the reduction in food stamp benefits. It Alex, is, and yeah. that's coming up. But first, Monroe County residents say despite multiple complaints, the state isn't doing enough to prevent erosion and runoff from the construction of Interstate 69. More than four inches of rain this past week pushed large amounts of dirt into creeks near the border of Monroe and Green Counties. Residents first noticed the state of similar runoff in July. Shortly after, the Depar Indiana Department of Environmental Management began working with contractors to construct barriers along the edges of the construction site. IDEM officials say they took further action this week using vacuum trucks to suck the sediment out of streams. But longtime I-69 opponents say the effort only further hurts sensitive wildlife in the creeks and is threatening further legal action against the state. Purdue University President Mitch Daniels says he made an error in judgment delivering a paid speech to a conservative think tank, the Center of the American Experiment. The Journal and Courier published a public letter from Daniels in its online edition Thursday. Daniels says he has turned down several appearances due to the potential downside, downside overshadowing any opportunity to promote the university. Daniels says he should have done the same with the Center of American Experiment and says he will use the fee he was paid to help fund scholarships that he and his wife Sherry have established to help Purdue students. In his public letter, Daniels did say the speech was, quote, scrupulously nonpartisan. Drug overdose deaths in Indiana have quadrupled over the last decade with the majority of those as a result of prescription drug abuse. That's according to a study released by Trust for America's Health. Officials there say one factor that contributes to Indiana's problem is pain reliever sales that are considerably higher in the state than many of its neighbors. Since 1999, only three other states have seen their overdose mortality rate increase as much as Indiana. Medical device companies are scaling back expansion plans that would have created jobs in the state. And officials say it's because of a tax included in the Affordable Care Act. Peel of the medical device tax, I am told by industry leaders in Indiana, would have a, a nearly immediate impact on investment and job creation in the Hoosier State. The Affordable Care Act contains an excise tax on medical devices. Governor Mike Pence says it could amount to a loss of $30 billion from the medical device industry, which employs 20,000 people in Indiana. Health officials say paying the tax will have a domino effect in the health industry, ultimately because device manufacturers will move their operations to other states and even other countries. If we keep losing our, our business uh, because they are taking their business elsewhere, then we don't have the jobs to support it. Bloomington-based Cook Medical estimates the 2.3 percent tax could cost the company between 15 and 20 million dollars each year. Governor Pence would like to see Congress and the president use the issue as a way to find common ground and end the federal government shutdown. The employee mandate portion of the Affordable Care Act is causing disturbances in some of Indiana's schools. These 15 public schools are joining the state in suing the IRS and other federal agencies over the Affordable Care Act. The attorney representing the school says the suit challenges the authority of the federal government to impose the health care mandate on state and public school corporations. The law calls for penalties on employers that fail to provide health insurance if they have 50 or more employees working 30 or more hours per week. State Democrats admit the Affordable Care Act isn't perfect, but are urging people to focus on its overall goal, which is to create a healthier nation. Benefits will be reduced next month for more than 900,000 Hoosiers on food stamps. The Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP benefits, commonly called food stamps, are given out based on family size. That means a family of four after November 1st 
will lose $36 a month in benefits. That's nearly a week's worth of meals. An official from a state food bank association says the reduction is not related to the federal government shutdown. Rather, the issue is federal stimulus dollars handed out in 2009 that are going away. The Indiana Supreme Court, along with judges and lawyers around the state, is exploring ways to provide more free and low-cost legal services to a growing number of Hoosiers. Twice a year, the Indianapolis Bar Association holds Ask a Lawyer events in the community, with around 100 lawyers providing free legal consultation. At its event this week, more than 600 people showed up, by far the highest number ever. Officials say the economic downturn is to blame. Indiana's Chief Justice says in an effort to encourage more lawyers to provide pro bono work, the state is considering offering what's called Continuing Legal Education, or CLE credit hours. Lawyers must earn a certain number of hours each year. The Indiana Bar Foundation has also established a new website where Hoosiers can submit a question that will be answered by legal professionals. Joe. Thank you very much, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. John Mellencamp and Stephen King collaborate to create a different kind of musical. What the masterminds behind Ghost Brothers of Darkland County are saying about their haunting new show. And is there room in Bloomington for a second charter school? How the proposed alternative to local district schools has revived the charter debate in Monroe County. Our state impact education reporting team has that story next, coming up on Indiana News Desk. We believe in the excitement of exploration, that life offers each of us adventures that are ours for the taking. We believe that children are born explorers who need trusted guides on their journeys of discovery. We believe in breaking new ground and in challenging assumptions that important questions deserve to be explored deeply, fairly, and honestly. And we believe that who you are and where you come from should never stand in the way of what you want to be. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. John Mellencamp and Stephen King's musical Ghost Brothers of Darkland County premiered Thursday night in Bloomington. John Mellencamp has had opportunities to make musicals. He could have made one like Mamma Mia that focused on his hits through the years. It would have likely been a huge success on Broadway, but as Sarah Whitmire reports, he settled on a darker path, working with King on an adaptation of a ghost story close to his hometown. Imagine this, it's a dark night in 1935. Two young brothers and a girl they both like are drinking and just hanging out at a cabin south of Bloomington. The boys get into an argument in front of the fireplace and one brother hits the other one in the head with a fire poker. The girl and the other brother go to get help, but driving into town they lose control of their car, go into a lake and they drown. This last part is particularly gruesome. The next day when officials find the other brother dead at the cabin, an animal had chewed off his head. By John Mellencamp's account, the ghosts of these young people actually haunt a cabin he owned in the 90s near Lake Monroe. More than a decade ago, he took the story to Stephen King and asked what he thought about collaborating on a show based on the tale. I'd never done a musical before, and John had never done a musical before, and he came down to see me, and we just kind of looked at each other and said, this is something really new. Let's edge out on a limb a little bit and try something. With the master of horror on board, the two began work on Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. Sometimes we would do it over the phone, sometimes we'd do it. Well, quite honestly, when we started, we were doing it over fax. We were, yeah. <laughs> we were faxing stuff. The, I don't think the internet had even been invented yet. It had been, but we didn't really know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> The two described the process of working with each other through the years on the project as a back and forth negotiation. Steve is really, you know, in charge of the story. And, and uh, uh, of course, he has much better ideas about the story than I do. Uh, but we found out almost by accident that Steve was telling the story and I was doing the character development through the songs. You know, I don't know that we ever really discussed that, but 
uh, it came to our attention pretty early on that, well, the songs are talking about the people and, and how they feel, and Steve's story is moving it forward. Heaven has turned me away so I can't get on my knees and pray. Mellencamp is vague about how true to life the show actually is. He says he has magazines and articles that detail what happened the night of the accident. But death records are hard to find, and it's impossible that two teens drowned here in Lake Monroe in the 1930s because the lake wasn't even built until the 1960s. John did the research. He, he found some true detective magazines from the 40s and told me some stories, and I made the rest of it up. My idea about research is as little as possible. My favorite thing that I asked Steve when I first met him, I said, so Steve, do you do an outline when you write a book? He goes, not since college and they made me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we talk about research, that's his research. <laughs> Mellencamp says he sold the cabin to a doctor from Indianapolis. The supernatural things he thought he didn't believe in became real to him and others who visited. I stayed in that cabin, and I stayed in the guest house by myself, and nobody was in the main house. And I did walk in there, and it was certifiably creepy. How so? Uh, you just had this vibe like somebody was doing that to you, back of your neck. And I stood in front of the fireplace where the alleged murder occurred, so I had to see that. And then I got out of there. I'm crippled on my cane. Mellencamp and King's fictional story isn't set in Indiana. They moved it to Mississippi and worked to capture the essence of the Delta. We kind of agreed that it would be great where it's a kind of a gothic story if we set it in the south with a feel of bayous and swamps and that sort of thing. So we did that and uh, we both read Tennessee Williams and looked at the movies and everything to kind of catch a feel for the sound. You know, of people might just say anything to try and say. The elements of a true collaboration are there, Mellencamp's earthiness and King's darkness. It doesn't give you the happy ending you might expect on Broadway, but who knows whether this show will actually make it there or whether the last curtain call will fall at the end of this Midwestern tour. Regardless, Mellencamp and King say it's already a success. We like to entertain, and if people come here to this show and clap their hands, we got a success. If people clap their hands and stand up, we got a big success. That's, that's all. And at the other end of that, I don't work for anybody and neither does he. So that's what keeps us honest to ourselves. We don't work for anybody. And now we go to State Impact Indiana where Kyle Stokes joins us. Plans are in the works to open Bloomington's second charter school. Plans that have Monroe County school officials concerned. Kyle, when would this new charter school open? Well, not until fall of 2015, Joe, and that's if Ball State University officials give the go-ahead for the proposed Green Meadows Charter School. But if they do, organizers say there will be plenty of demand. Students already face long wait lists at Bloomington's other charter school, and that has Monroe County Community Schools Corporation leaders worried about an exodus of potentially 200 students, which would cost the district about a million dollars in per-pupil funding, about the equivalent of more than 20 MC. CSC teaching jobs. This is a charter school that speaks to Bloomington's liberal arts sensibilities. At a recent public meeting, organizers said Green Meadows curriculum would emphasize environmental sustainability, social justice, arts, music, even handcrafts. Some opponents said the pitch was compelling, but they fear the new school will drain not only funding, but engaged families from the district. Those who favor the charter proposal, though, say their children need a school where they can fit in. Bloomington's second charter school would be one of only 20 outside of Indianapolis or Gary, only the fourth in South Central Indiana. Compare that to more than 50 schools in Indy and in Northwest Indiana, as you can see on this map that you can find right now on stateimpactindiana.org. Key date to remember now, November 1st. That's when a panel rewriting the state's grading system for schools must make a final recommendation for how to issue those A through F ratings your child's school gets. But at least one member of that panel is worried the state won't meet that deadline. The Indiana Chamber of Commerce's Derek Rettelman 
said that on a, the HRF review panel said during this week's meeting that he was concerned the group hadn't seen any proposed models with less than a month left to complete its work. State Superintendent Glenda Ritz assured him the work would get done. The Indiana General Assembly wants the State Board of Education to adopt the new A-F grading system before Thanksgiving. One other reason to keep November 1st circled on your calendar, if the federal government shutdown continues until then, that could mean some Indiana Head Start programs would be forced to shut down. So far, the shutdown hasn't impacted the early childhood programs for low-income kids in Indiana because many received their federal funding before the federal government shut down, but other programs were supposed to get that payment on November 1st. Without the funding, they'd have to close down. We'll keep following that story, Joe, and we'll post any updates on our right. website, stateimpactindiana.org. Thank you very much, Kyle. And the Super Bowl could find its way to Indianapolis. This week, the NFL announced Indianapolis as one of the three finalists to host the 2018 Super Bowl, with New Orleans and Minneapolis also on the shortlist. The city received high marks when it hosted Super Bowl 46 last year. Indianapolis Mayor Greg Ballard says the economic impact of the game prompted him to support another bid. The 32 NFL owners will vote on the host city in May. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. We end this week's show with John Mellencamp and one of the songs from his new musical, Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. The show is touring the Midwest. It returns to Indiana for five shows, including another one in Bloomington on the 23rd. For all of us here at WTIU, have a great weekend. You can hear with those ears And you can speak with that tongue The truth looks so far Indiana away. News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com And by WTIU members. Thank you.